Happy Sunday. Psalm 24, 1-2 says, The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. For He has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Let us pray. Lord, we acknowledge that You are the Creator of earth and all who live in it. That's about 8 billion people. We also acknowledge that You have created the waters on, the, on this planet. An incredible 328 million cubic miles of water. Ultimately, You rule the winds and the waves and, and can handle massive forces. We acknowledge, Lord, that our lives are entrusted into Your hands. We are definitely in good hands. Lord, during this time of worship, help us, Lord, be in awe of You. Help us, Lord, to worship You in spirit and in truth. We lift it to You this week's birthday celebrants, John Shepherd and Delaney Illumin. You know their lives, O oh Lord God. You know their strengths and their weaknesses. Touch their hearts and minds to seek You. Help them, Lord, to love You and live for You. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. My name is Edouard Ndeki, and I'm from Senegal. 95% of people where I grow up are not Christian. But from all of that population, God picked my dad to be a pastor. Growing up was not easy seeing your friends going to school. We have to stay at home because my parents didn't have money to send us at school. I was so upset because all my friends have everything they want. When I say, Dad, why we are not blessed like them? And he said, even if you don't eat, even if you don't have stuff, Edward, remember that you have God. I was involved in the group Good News Club. That Wednesday was amazing. We were coming to have fun, laughed, joke to do all of that. And uh, we received a box. We opened it. In the side of the box was toothbrush. I didn't have to brush when I was growing up. We used charcoal and salt to brush our teeth. Having it for the first time was just a miracle. This is the wow. It was wrapped like this. I didn't know what is inside. Carefully, this is my yo-yo. This is my yo-yo. Every day, every night, with the neighborhood, we always play. Someone cares. God, He cares so much. He has to use someone somewhere around the world to pack my box. I came to the United States because of my background, being a track athlete. I was involved in the church in my local town. And one time, I saw the boxes I received when I was 14. And I was so excited. I didn't have words. I was just like, what is, 
What is this? Where did this come from? It's reality here, people. It's you guys are doing this for real? And they say, yes. I say, I received one when I was 14 and everybody was so happy. Everybody was looking at me like, yes, you are in our church. Seeing God connecting me being 14 and coming to United States and to see the two elements just connected as a perfect picture, show me that I'm in the right spot. I'm in the right place serving the Lord. Daniel is my son. Daniel is the version of Edward in Senegal, but in the United States. Talking to him is the opportunity like my dad told me. No matter what you struggle with, remember, you have a God that loves you. Daniel packed boxes, and he liked to say also his dad received one. In the corner of this universe, you have a kid that is waiting for you to pack a box for them. It's not just a shoe box that you are packing. You are changing lives. We're going to continue our series in the Minor Prophets. So let's review, starting with Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. My four children are important to me. Losing any of them would be tragic. I can still remember the times we almost lost some of them. <laughs> One time, Andrea, when she was maybe four years old, she decided to go on her own at our Target parking lot. And a car was backing up that couldn't see her. I shouted, and the car stopped. Twice, Nathan was lost. One, one time it was at Disneyland, and, when, when, and another time was at a huge neighborhood garage sale. I remember searching frantically all around, not knowing if we were ever going to fi find him, or even if we were going in the right direction. But by God's grace, he was found, obviously. We should have gripped their little hands and not let them go during those times. They are, they are very valuable to us. They are precious to us. They mean a lot to us. And because of this, they affect the way we live. We make certain choices in, in our lives because of our kids. In life, there are many things that can grip, can grip us, that we, we hold on to, that we grip. And we grip those things because they have value. They are precious and mean a lot to us. And when we have that kind of attitude towards those things, it affects the way we live. Today, as we continue in our book of Habakkuk, we're going to find out what things gripped their lives, the Babylonians, and how it affected them. So turn your Bibles to Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 12 to 20. I'm using the New King James Version, Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 12 to 20. Just for context and background, Habakkuk was complaining to God of how terrible life was in Judah because of the corruption of his people. He was waiting for God to do something. Therefore, God decided to do what? Do you remember? He allowed the Babylonians to deal with the people of Judah. So in this book, it talks about how God was going to bring the ruthless, prideful, enormous, and powerful Babylonian Empire to deal with the lawless people of Judah. But because God is just, God will also punish the Babylonians for what they will do to Judah. And today we're going to see why. Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 12 to 20. Let's look at 12 to 13 here. Remember, we're talking about the Babylonians. Verse 12 to 13. What sorrows await you, awaits you who build cities with money gained through murder and corruption? Has not the Lord of the heavens' armies promised that the wealth of nations will turn to ashes? They work so hard, but all in vain. At this point of history, according to Levius.org, the Babylonian Empire was the most powerful state in the ancient, 
ancient world after the fall of the Assyrian army in 612 BC. Its capital Babylon was beautifully adorned by King Nebuchadnezzar II who erected several famous buildings. In fact, as you can see here, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon was considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. According to National Geographic, legend has it that this, this garden paradise was planted on an artificial mountain and constructed to please the wife of King Nebuchadnezzar II. How was this grandeur of Babylon built? With money gained through murder and corruption. As this empire conquered other nations, they took the people from these nations as slaves, as workers, as in essence animals to help build the beautiful cities. They didn't care about the workers. They didn't care about the workers' well-being. They treated them as commodities that they could easily replace with other conquered people. If people died through accidents, fatigue, hunger, or being overworked, no real loss for them. What was more important was that the construction continued. They were like the modern day forced labor by people like Put Paul of the Khmer Rouge who forced Cambodians to grow rice. These workers daily battled dehydration and starvation which killed approximately, approximately one million people. With Hitler, again with forced labor, approximately killing six million Jews. That's how bad the working conditions were for the prisoners of war back in Babylon. But God says to the Babylonians, whose grip was, was held to the beauty of, of this world. But according to verse 13, all that they built on murder and corruption will turn into ashes and will, and will all be in vain. An example, some expert archaeologists, they can't even find the trace of the grandeur of this empire. For them, it never existed. Verse 14. For as the waters fill the sea, the earth will be filled with an awareness of the glory of the Lord. Although Babylon's grandeur disappeared, God's glory and splendor at the end will be revealed in it as surely as the waters fill the sea. This gave the people of Judah hope Yes, even through the, through the struggles, this gave them hope that, there, that, that especially those who were still alive, enslaved under the Babylonian Empire, that at the end of time, God and His people will win. That there's hope in the midst of this horrible rule of the Babylonians. Probably this kind of, this was like the Spaniard rule over the Philippines. Not only were the Babylonians gripped to the beauty of this world, but also to the worldly pleasures. Look what they did to the surrounding nations in verses 15 to 17. What sour awaits you who make your neighbors drunk, who force your cup on them, so that you can gloat over their shameful nakedness? But soon it will be your turn to be disgraced. Come, drink, and be exposed. Drink from the cup of the Lord's judgment, and all your glory will be turned into shame. You who cut, who cut down the forces of Lebanon, now you will be cut down. You destroyed the wild animals, so now their terror will be, on you, will be yours. You committed murder throughout the countryside and filled the towns with violence. They disgrace their captives by making them drunk and gloat over their nakedness. They destroyed forests and animals and murdered people all for their pleasure. Do you remember the movie Cinder's List? I remember watching uh, the main character Amon Goeth as he was shooting Jews from his balcony just for his pleasure. That's how depraved 
their minds were for themselves, how they gripped the, for the things for themselves for vanity's sake, regardless of who gets hurt. It seems horrific. But remember, one of God's character is that He is just. He will not let the just go unpunished. Like what was said in the previous passage, what the Babylonians will do to their conquered nations, God will do to them. They will not escape judgment. Verse 18 to 19. What good is an idol carved by man or cast or a cast image that deceives you? How foolish to trust in your own creation, a God that can't even talk. What sorrow awaits you who say to wooden idols, wake up and save us? To speechless stone images you say, rise up and teach us. Can an idol tell you what to do? They may be overlaid with gold and silver, but they are lifeless inside. The Babylonians were worshiping man-made idols who couldn't do anything, but still they worshiped them. It didn't make sense. Reminds me when Elijah had a battle with worshipers of Baal, the false god. They set up two sac he, he, he set up two sac sacrifices, one for Baal and one for the living God. Elijah let the Baal prophets start, start to see if their God would do anything to their sacrifice. Turn to 1 Kings 18, 1 Kings 18, 26 to 29. Verse 26. So they prepared one of the bulls and placed it on their altar. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning, imagine this, morning till noontime, shouting, O Baal, answer us! Again, from morning till noon. But there was no reply of any kind. Then they danced, hobbling around the altar they had, the altar they had made. About noontime, Elijah began mocking them. He says to them, You'll have to shout louder, he scoffed. For surely he's, he is a god. Perhaps he is daydreaming, daydreaming or relieving himself. Or maybe he's a, away on a trip or is asleep and much needs to be awakened. So, the prophets of Baal, they shouted louder and began uh, following their normal customs. Customs, they cut themselves with knives and swords until the blood until bl the blood gushed out. They ra they raved all afternoon until time of the evening sacrifice, but still there was no sound, no reply, no response. But look what happened when Elijah spoke. Verse 36 now of 1 Kings 18. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in, you are God in Israel and I am your servant and have done all these things at your word. O oh Lord, hear me, O oh Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God, and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Verse 38, Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Sometimes people make false gods. These false idols and knowingly and unknowingly, people start worshiping them. I was thinking, why would people like these Babylonians, carve and cast metal objects and start worshiping them, knowing they're not 
able to do anything. At the Wednesday Bible study, it was mentioned one possible reason that they started worshiping these man-made objects. One possible reason is control. Since they made these objects, they're able to control what's right and what's wrong, what is good and what is bad, and not be accountable to anyone or anything. The Babylonian people gripped the beauty of this world, they gripped the pleasures of this world, and now they grip the control of their own lives. It may feel good to be free from God and do whatever they want to do, again, because they made their own gods and they've made their own rules, morals, but according to Proverbs 12, 14, 12, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Many times, as people today, we can be like the Babylonians, gripping to the beautiful things of this world, gripping to the pleasures of this world, gripping to having control of our lives. Jesus dealt with this directly in Mark 10, 17-22. Now as he was going out on the road, one man came running, or one came, one came running, knelt before him and asked, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. You know, the, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. Then Jesus looked at him, loved him and said, One thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. Verse 22. But he was sad at this word, and went away sorrowful. Why? For he had great possessions. Why didn't he grip Jesus? For he had great possessions, beautiful possessions. Why didn't he grip Jesus? Number two, he could afford many pleasures which he didn't really want to let go. Why didn't he grip Jesus? Number three, because being rich, I mean, he probably had he, he, he probably uh, felt power and control over his life. There weren't many people telling him what to do or how to do things. He was the commander of his life. These things held him back from following Jesus. It held him, it held him from gripping Jesus. Let's look at the last verse in Habakkuk 2, verse 20. But the Lord is in His holy temple. In contrast with the, the idols that we just talked about in the previous verses, the Lord is not in an earthly container like the Babylonians' mad-made idols. But the Lord is in His holy temple, in heaven. He's real. He's alive. He's powerful. He's God Almighty. He's a creator of the world. He's a king of kings and lord of lords. What else in verse 20? It says, Let the, all the earth be silent before him. Meaning, be all of God. Be silent before him. Be in a state of humility. Be in a state of reverence towards him. Bow down and kneel before him. Be in a state of worship. Now, let's go back to Mark 10, 17. Nor is the rich man 
Notice how he, he acknowledged Jesus. He acknowledged Jesus as a good teacher. I don't think that person, that, that person, that man acknowledged Jesus as God. However, he did kneel before him as a sign of respect, but he wasn't in awe of Jesus. He didn't revere him to the point of worshiping him. Brothers and sisters, let's acknowledge the one who saved us from condemnation of sin. Let's be in awe of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is before us on a daily basis, because then our daily choices may be different. Let me ask you this question. Do we grip our possessions or do we grip onto Jesus? Do we grip our pleasures or do we grip onto Jesus? Do we grip on to our control or do we grip onto Jesus? Brothers and sisters, let's be in awe and grip onto God our Father. God the Lord and Savior, God the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Lord, I know that there are so many temptations in life, so many distractions, so many ways we can focus on the things of this world, like the beauty of this world, the pleasures of this world, Lord, and, and wanting to control our lives. But Lord, help us, Lord, be humble and give all those things to you. Help us, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.
Finally, brethren, farewell, be complete, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. In Jesus' name, Amen.